Welcome to Session 17 of Complexity Explorer's MESA Tutorial, Major Base Modeling for Python. For this session, we're going to complete our trade algorithm, which will actually complete our model uh, where all our agents are doing the interactions that we expect. Uh, it's, this is really a continuation of Part 3, where we're finishing the model. Instead of recapping uh, the overview of the model, we're really going to focus on recapping where we're at in our trade algorithm right now. So let's get started. First, you do want to make sure you've got your Google Colab or other IDE up uh, and running and that your model is working and it should be producing a series of true and false statements. Those true and false statements uh, tell us whether or not the trade criteria is met. So with that, right, remember we call from trade with neighbors, a couple uh, actions here where we determine our neighbor agents, then call the trade function. The trade function first does a quick check. And then it calculates our marginal rate of substitution uh, for each of the agents. So if we go up to calculate our MRS, we can see that calculation here, right, which is a ratio between uh, our, the agent sugar and spice endowment to metabolism. So after we calculate the MRS, then we calculate their welfare, and then we see if their MRS uh, is close. If it is, we return. However, I made a mistake here. Uh, where I made it too coarse grain using the rel tall function, right? It should just default to the uh, is close uh, out to the maximum, which is uh, nine decimal points, right? But make it too coarse grain, that'll have some impacts later on uh, because people won't be trading at their optimum uh, because it is just a ratio between their sugar and spice. In addition, I did the same thing here with candidate uh, indices, right? Where we did the math is close for max welfare, I, and I made it too coarse grained by making it only out to two decimal spots based off how the Cobb Doug Douglas function is calculated. Right? That would just be uh, that's a little bit too much. In this case, we're using the other time at final candidates, right? Uh, based off the grid square, uh, two decimal places is fine, right? Because the grid uh, on a 50 by 50 is pretty coarse grained. Now, let this be a critical lesson that. Uh, Any time you're comparing two float numbers, it's a big deal, and you really got to think through how coarse grain or not coarse grain you want it to be. Okay. All right. So now that we've discussed that, uh, we're back in our um, uh, our maybe cell spice function. Okay. So this is where we have our two trade criteria. We just deleted our print statement to say whether or not our criteria uh, is met. Right. So if uh, our criteria are not met, so effectively, uh, then we want to stop the function. So if both agents are better, uh, both underscore agents underscore better underscore off, which is true or false, and MRS underscore not underscore crossing is also false, if either one of those is false, then we want to return. Uh, the, we want to return false, uh, which as you'll see a little bit, tells us that uh, sale did not happen. However, if both criteria are true, then we know that the criteria is met and we actually want to execute the exchange of sugar and spice, right? So criteria met, uh, execute uh, the exchange or execute the trade. And so we'll add another helper function here and we'll call this cell spice. This will take three parameters. So first the other agent object and then the amount of sugar to be exchanged. Right, and the amount of spice to be exchanged. So these are, this is the variable we calculated at the beginning uh, uh, of this function. And if that occurs, we'll just add this now, we're going to return true. Right? So this is saying that an exchange did in fact occur. Right? Now let's build this helper function of set cell spice. We'll put this just above our maybe spell cell spice um, function. That way I kind of keep them together, co-located. And this one will be you know, def cell underscore spice. Because it's part of the trader class, we need to put uh, the self variable and then the other, which is the other agent object, the amount of sugar to be exchanged, the amount of spice to be exchanged. So we'll just call these sugar and spice. right? And then this is going to be a fairly simple function where we just add sugar to one, take it away from the other, and then the same with spice. First, some comments. Right? So uh, this is. I'm going to put this is used in maybe cell, cell spice. And then this fundamentally executes the trade. Right? So it exchanges 
uh, the sugar and, and spice. All right, it's a fairly simple function. We just deprecate, uh, so we add uh, sugar to the self agent. And then we detract or we take away that sugar from the other agent. And then we're going to uh, take away spice from the self agent. And then we're going to add spice to the other agent. That's kind of a fa fairly simple uh, setup. We're just going to uh, add or subtract away from agent attributes uh, based off what they need. Okay, so I'm going to run that just to see if I get syntax errors, which I don't. Okay, and then we've got cell spice. Um, and so now we're executing the trade if the trade criteria are met. And if they are, then we also return true. Um, and why this is going to happen is we're going to show you now the um, uh, in the trade function, right? So if we go back to our trade function, we calculate the price, and then if our MRS self is greater than the MRS of other, right, then that means that we are uh, we want to buy some uh, sugar. Uh, and as this can get pretty confusing as we look at both variants, uh, we're going to add that in the comments just to make remind ourselves, right? So if this case, if MRS of self is greater than other, then self is a sugar buyer and spice seller. You can see this if you go up to the cell spice function and even by the title of the function, right? Maybe cell spice, right? So, uh, so uh, spice seller, right? Now, if the criteria weren't met, then sold, what we returned, is going to be false, right? So no, uh, no trade because criteria is not met. And if that happens, we're not going to be able to trade with this particular uh, agent for whatever reason. And so we're just going to uh, return, right? We're going to end the function, right? So now we can... Uh, instead of having to write all the different variations, uh, we could just use those same functions by altering how we do the parameters. So if the MRS of self is less than the MRS of other, then we can execute fundamentally the same function. We just swap uh, the parameters and who's calling the function. So in this case, self is a spice buyer, right, and a sugar seller. Okay? And so we'll do sold equals. Now, in this case, instead of self, we're going to call the other one. So it would be other dot maybe underscore cell underscore spice. Right? So we're just reversing every time spice and or self and other. Right? Instead of the parameter of other, it's going to be self. The price will go in. And then it'll be welfare of other. And then the welfare uh, of self. Right? As the parameters. And this will just reverse the flow of sugar and spice. Uh, so now person who was gaining sugar is gaining spice, and the one who was losing um, sugar uh, is now gaining sugar. Okay, so then we'll put a comment here. So again, uh, this will be the same as the last one. Uh, if there's no trade, that uh, if sold is false, that means there's no trade, the criteria was not met, right? So just put if not sold, right, return. So now with this, uh, we've fundamentally completed the exchange of sugar and spice, but we want to collect data to ensure that we have the price recorded, uh, and uh, we're also going to do the trade network, uh, which we'll use in our next uh, two sessions. All right, so we want to capture the data of this trade. It's really the essence of the model. So it's important to point out here that all these return statements, if the trade doesn't occur, effectively is creating an implicit if statement, where if a sale uh, does occur, right, then we're going to capture the data, right? But because all these return statements will terminate the trade function, uh, that we don't have to explicitly write out that if statement, right? We could just capture the data. So uh, self dot prices, uh, we're going to dot append the price, right? So again, where we place this means that the price will only be appended if a trade happens, right? And we're going to uh, capture our trade partners. Right, so uh, which agents are we trading with? Right, we'll just do that by using their unique ID. So do self dot trade partners dot append other dot unique ID. So if a trade occurs, then we'll capture them. 
uh, then we'll capture that agent's ID so we can you know, later on build out the trade network and kind of see the dynamics of their trade. Now the trick is we actually don't actually have these as attributes for our agents. Uh, so we need to go up here uh, and add them in. So, start, so we just go up to when we initialize the function, uh, add in self.prices, we'll just make this an empty list, right? And also add self.trade underscore partners and make this an empty list. Okay, so now every time we execute the trade, we'll be able to say what the price is for each trade, right? And remember, it happens incrementally. Um, and then we'll be able to say who we traded with, which will also tell us how many times a trade occurred, right, uh, before the, tr uh, the criteria wasn't met and we terminated the function. So as this function occurs incrementally for each price, right, we're going to use recursion to now call the trade function again. Uh, and when the criteria is not met, then the, the trade algorithm will be terminated. All right, so we're going to continue trading, and all we have to do there is just call self.trade uh, and then uh, the, use the other agent parameter and pass in that object. Uh, and then we'll use recursion. If the trade criteria is not met at any point, all right, uh, then the algorithm stops, and this will prevent us from having an infinite loop. Right, now we can go back to our trade with neighbors function. All right, uh, and we actually made a change here, right, where before I said, hey, if there's no uh, agents, we're going to trade, we're going to return trade and price network, we don't need to return anything because those are now part of our agent attributes. Okay, uh, and I will put here just for completeness that uh, if uh, after you've traded with all the potential neighbors, right, then we're also going to return and, uh, uh, and end the trade with neighbors function. And I get rid of this comment because it's no longer relevant. Okay, and again, the trade with neighbors uh, just uh, terminates um, if they have no neighbor agents to trade to, and that just prevents a bunch of unnecessary calls. The next thing we need to do is move down to our model class and now, somewhat counterintuitively, clear our uh, price, uh, our agent's price and their trade partners. The reason for this is we can use data collector to collect the price, the prices and the trade partners for each step and it'll just be easier to analyze. This will make more sense in the next lesson when we actually do data collecting. Uh, so in this first part of agent.trade.shuffle, before we do move, eat, and maybe die, where we're, we're gonna clear our prices and we're gonna clear our trade partners and kind of reset those attributes back to zero. Okay, then uh, to ensure since we wrote a lot of code, uh, we're going to add a print statement here just to make sure we're getting what we think we're getting, uh, which is a list of prices uh, and a list of uh, unique IDs of the agents that they traded with uh, per the number of times that they traded with them. Okay. Uh, so we can just add that right here. So under our second uh, trader shuffle, where we right after we trade with neighbors, then we're going to agent.prices. Uh, and agent dot trade partners, right? So this should give us a list of prices that we traded at, right? As well as a list of partners uh, with a part with their unique ID for every time we traded with them. Okay. Um, so we just call our instantiated uh, version of the model. We run it one time, and sure enough, that's what we get. see. A lot of agents are trading, right? And some agents trade once, um, and some agents trade multiple times with the same agent, uh, or trade, you know. Uh, once with one agent, twice with another agent, etc. Right? And now we have a fully functioning trader sugarscape model where our trader agents traverse a sugar and spice landscape and then also trade sugar and spice in order to survive in the trade. The next thing we have to do is validate that the model is actually working the way we expect it to. So in the next two lessons, we'll use Mesa's data collector to collect data and do a quick analysis uh, in order to validate our model and make sure it's behaving the way we think it should based off growing artificial societies. So that wraps up session 17. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.